Well, welcome everyone to another session of the data learning seminars. This uh, week we have Francisco Sali from Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. He is he will be working uh, talking about warp um, physics informed neural networks about um, sign MR imaging registration. So Francisco, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And yep, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the invitation and to give this talk. And this is a collaboration uh, from people mainly working in Chile, um, but now some of them are, are moved abroad since we started this work. Um, and I will talk about how we can use physics informal networks to do image registration, but for a particular task, uh, which is a cine, a cardiac cine uh, images. So um, the motivation is um, is that heart, heart disease is one of the leading causes of death in the world, and because the the heart is the is the pump is the pump that that distributes the blood in our bodies. Um, if you have a mechanical problem in your heart, uh, it ha can have some very serious consequences. So typically the, the cardiac function, function is uh, assessed with some very simple metrics like the ejection fraction so here you are seeing a picture of the left ventricle which is the main pump uh, in our heart and the ejection fraction is just the difference in volume between when the heart is filled which that is referred as the diastolic uh, volume and the systolic volume so if your ejection fraction drops that means that you're pumping less blood and that is typically associated with uh, some serious uh, conditions. But this is a very simplistic metric and there are some um, diseases that cannot be detected with this, uh, with this metric. And one example of this is uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And as the name says, the ejection fraction doesn't change, but your heart is not working properly. And if we look here at, at this simulation, we can see, uh, especially here in the bottom plot, uh, that the, the here I'm cho showing how the, the fibers in the heart stretch, and you can see that it's not very heterogeneous. So you can have a uh, very different uh, patterns in the heart uh, of how the heart is contracting, and maybe we can use this information to identify different diseases. So. The, the one of the goals that we have set for this work is to compute a cardiac strain. So first I'm going to uh, explain that. And for that, I need to introduce the cardiac cycle. So as I told you uh, before, the, uh, we start here at end diastole. This is when the heart is filled with blood. Uh, then the heart starts contracting, but keeping the volume uh, constant. And then uh, one of the valves open and the uh, blood is released from the, from the left ventricle. And we have the ejection phase where the volume of the heart decreases. And then we have some um, relaxation. And then the heart, uh, the left ventricle is filled again uh, from blood that is coming from the uh, left atria. And this uh, cardiac cycle uh, repeats itself as you can see in this, in this movie here. So how do we define cardiac strain? So we're going to set our reference configuration. So the, ref the configuration that we assume is going to be uh, maybe free of stress. I mean, though we know that that is not actually true, but that's, this is what is done typically in clinics, uh, in a clinical setting. And we're going to define how the heart uh, def uh, deforms by a deformation mapping fee that will take us to any other time during the cardiac cycle. And in this um, reference configuration, we are going to define a, a local coordinate system that is the longitudinal, longitudinal coordinate, um, a, a radial coordinate that goes across the thickness of the myocardium, and a circumferential, uh, circumferential uh, coordinate that is tangent uh, to these other two coordinates. And this is some continuing mechanics, but from if we know the formation mapping, we can compute the deformation gradient. And here, one of the key ones, this is the Jacobian of the deformation gradient. And this will represent, uh, represent local changes in the, in the volume of the tissue. Um, and we will use this quite a bit during the presentation. And then we can define the, the Lagrange strain from the deformation gradient. 
and then we can do projections uh, to get the longitudinal strain, the circumferential strain, and the radial strain. So one of the key uh, facts that we're going to use uh, for this work is that the, that the cardiac tissue is nearly incompressible. That means that uh, no matter how I, I push it, the volume of that tissue will remain roughly uh, constant. It's not like a like a sponge, for example, that I can fully compress and reduce its volume. If I try to do that with cardiac tissue, the volume will roughly uh, stay the same. So mathematically, that means that the Jacobian needs to be uh, close to one. So what are the uh, current methods used to uh, determine cardiac strain? So first we have a uh, ultrasound, uh, which is inexpensive and it's easy to access, but you can see from the image quality here, um, it's not very uh, accurate. Uh, the other uh, option would be tagged MRI, which is a specific uh, sequence to, that is designed to uh, acquire the, the, the displacement information. And if we have the displacement, we can have the information mapping and we can compute the strain directly, but it's really long to acquire um, and it's not very popular. Uh, it's not something that is performing in clinics very uh, often. And finally, we have a CNA MRI, uh, which is uh, much more common. It's, it's the most common sequence uh, for cardiac function assessment. Um, so there are a lot of, of, of uh, CNA images going around, and you can find online databases uh, from this uh, type of images. But uh, the problem is that we don't have any direct information of how the heart is moving. So we don't know the deformation mapping. So the goal of this work is to extract uh, the displacement information from scene MRI. So we would like to determine this deformation mapping from directly from the CNA images uh, in order to uh, compute a cardiac strain later. So the way that we are going to tackle this problem is by solving an image registration problem. Um, so let's say that we have uh, two images uh, during the cardiac cycle. We're going to uh, set the end diastolic uh, image uh, where you see that the heart is largest uh, as a reference image. And we will have another uh, image during the cardiac cycle that will be the template image. So uh, the image registration problem is to find a deformation mapping such that if I compose uh, this deformation mapping with the template image, I will get an image that is closer to the reference image. So we can uh, mathematically pose this as a minimization problem where I have some distance function um, that, and we will try to minimize the distance between the reference uh, image uh, and the template image composed with the deformation mapping. And this is an ill-posed problem, so we always need to add some kind of uh, regularization. So the way that we are going to uh, try to solve these problems is with physics in formula networks. And I'm going to do a very brief introduction if you haven't uh, heard of, of this uh, technique. So um, the, the, this idea, um, was originally from the 90s, but it was revived in 2017. Um, and the idea here is that for some problems you, you have in traditional machine learning, you only have data, but for some problems, um, you also know the physics of the phenomena. And the idea here is that you not only um, encourage the network to learn the data, but you also encourage the network to learn uh, the physics of this problem. So how this is done. So here I'm showing a, an example where uh, they um, learn the, the, the in, in, a, in an aneurysm, they try to learn the pressure and the velocity from uh, some concentration data. So here they have a neural, a fully connected neural network, and then uh, they output the velocities and the pressures and the concentrations. Um, and they have data about the concentration, so they can just uh, learn that directly from data. But to learn the other quantities, they use the Navier-Stokes uh, uh, equations. And from that, they can uh, learn not only the, the, 
the, the concentration, which was actually the data, but they can also learn the velocities and the, and the pressures. So here I'm going to introduce it a bit more formally. So, uh, le, so we, we will consider a problem where we have some partial uh, uh, observations of some variable u of x, and uh, we have a model uh, for this variable in the form of a PDE uh, that we can write in a residual form. Uh, uh, and this could be something very, very uh, general. So it could be a nonlinear operate, differential operator uh, with some parameters that maybe we can even learn. And just an, as a very simple example, this uh, operator n can be uh, a Poisson equation where I have the Laplacian of u, of u minus some uh, force in term lambda equals to zero. So this will be equivalent to writing the Poisson equation in a residual form. So we will have some data um, located at some point ui, uh, sorry, uh, located at, at some positions xi. We, will, we may have some boundary conditions, for example, Newman boundary conditions, uh, where, we, where we know the flux of this quantity um, u, and we will also know those locations. And the, the key idea here is that we're going to approximate the solution uh, with a neural network. So traditionally, we approximate this, for example, with finite elements. But here, the, the difference is that we're going to, uh, say, approximate this function with a, a neural network. And typically, it's a fully connected neural network. Um, so now the task becomes learning what are the, uh, the optimal parameters so, I, so u satisfies the model and the data. So, to achieve that, we are, we are going to use three different loss terms. So uh, we're going to use some uh, a loss term that is related to the data, some loss term that is re related to the partial differential equation, and another term that is related to the boundary. And the first term, uh, the mean square error of the data, is just what it says is this is, comes from basically any regression problem in machine learning, we will use something like this. So this encourages the network to approximate the data that we have. Now, the second term uh, encodes, uh, encodes the model. So here, we're going to penalize the square of the residual form uh, of, of our PDE. So this will, you can see that if we, the minimum of this is just making n equals to zero. And if we make n equals to zero, we are exactly satisfying our, our PD. So that's what we want. And what is really interesting here is that we will use some uh, collocation points to evaluate this loss. And this is maybe one of the biggest differences from uh, traditional methods like finite elements is that we don't actually need any structure on this data. We can just randomly sample points inside the domain and uh, to compute this loss term. And, and it, it generally it works uh, very, very well. So we don't need to compute a full integral. We just need to sample uh, a couple of points uh, inside, inside the domain. In, and it will work fine. And another important point is that we will use automatic differentiation to uh, compute the uh, differential uh, operator. So it becomes very easy to compute something like the Laplacian or the gradient of u. And the last term is the, the boundary condition uh, term. And here we can also compute the gradient of u using automatic differentiation. So this is actually very similar to the previous term in case we have some boundary conditions uh, like this. And if we have the Dirichlet boundary conditions, we can just simply add them as data. Okay, so here's what, what we are proposing to solve the, the, um, the image registration problem. So uh, with physics informed uh, neural networks, sorry. So what we, our idea is to, uh, we propose to use a fully connected neural network that takes us inputs uh, the positions in the image. And then uh, the output will be the deformation mapping. And when then our uh, data loss uh, becomes this uh, image registration problem where we're going to compose the template image with the deformation mapping. And then we're going to compare it to the, uh, to the reference image. 
And then we also need some regularization. And for, for this, we will use the incompressibility or near incompressibility of, of cardiac tissue as our, uh, as our physics. And we will also add some uh, hyperelastic regularization that I will explain later. So one of the problems that we immediately face uh, when, when trying to do this with uh, traditional physics informed neural networks is the spectral bias. So, and this is a well-known and, and well-documented uh, fact that uh, fully connected neural networks uh, tend to learn the low frequencies uh, first. Uh, so they tend to learn low frequency functions first. So if, that's why if you do some regression problem, even though if the data might be very noisy, if you train not, don't train very long, you will get, still get a very smooth uh, curve. Um, so the solution for this is, uh, there are many solutions, but one of them is, is to, to use what is called Fourier features. And the idea here is to change the, the input of the domain uh, to include some higher frequency functions. So you can think that uh, by default, the, the input of the network looks something like this. So we have our coordinates, which are X and Y that vary very slowly. But if you could do some transformation to this uh, input domain to include uh, some higher frequencies, maybe the neural networks the neural networks can overcome this uh, spectral bias. And the way this is done is that uh, we define a, actually a determinist, a, a predefined mapping, gamma of X, that will uh, concatenate um, sines of X and cosines of X. And the, the exact frequencies that we're going to use uh, will be encoded in this matrix P. And actually we're going to sample, these frequencies will be, will be random. And we are going to sample them from a normal distribution with zero mean and, um, and, a, and, and a variance of gamma of sigma squared. So in, if you do that, you will get something like this, where you have um, different frequencies uh, as input that are also rotated in different directions. Uh, because this B matrix is uh, M by two, so the, this also adds some correlation between uh, the X and Y coordinates. And here you can see that this is a sine, and here I have the same image, but uh, with a cosine. So it's just concatenating those um, sines and cosines. And so here we'll introduce two hyperparameters. So M, the number of Fourier features, and uh, uh, sigma squared, uh, the, the, the variance of the, of the frequencies that we want to introduce. And if you want to introduce higher um, frequencies, you just uh, include, uh, uh, increase this parameter sigma squared. So, we um, so we included that in our network, and this is how our how we train our network. So we'll have um, three different terms in our loss function. So the first one is the image similarity, um, which is corresponds to the image registration problem, and then we'll have some some near incompressible hyperelastic regularization that will I will explain in a minute. And we also have some uh, background hyperelastic regularization. So we will uh, penalize uh, the incompressibility more inside the heart than outside the heart, uh, because we, we don't have any knowledge about how the rest of the tissues that appear in the image uh, behave. So for the hyperelastic regularization, we used kind of the simplest material that you can use, uh, which is a neo -Hugian. Um, this has a couple of terms, but maybe the most important one is this um, lambda uh, times uh, j minus one squared. So j is the, uh, the the Jacobian of the deformation gradient, and it quantifies volume changes. Volume volume changes. So if j is greater than one, this means that the that locally the tissue is expanding, uh, and if j is less than one, locally the tissue is compressing. So if we set it uh, uh, to one or really close to one, the, the tissue is not experiencing, experiencing any uh, changes in, in, in volume, which means that it's uh, uh, nearly incompressible. So that's exactly what we want. So for that, we are going to set this uh, lambda parameter for the incompressible region. So that means the heart 
uh, much, much bigger than the uh, background region. So uh, for the next part, I'm going to show you some synthetic examples um, just to show you uh, how, we, how we did those. Um, so we trained um, for 10,000 iterations with Adam, and then we applied uh, a couple, uh, we applied the BFGS optimizer, and then we use a batch size of 1,000 uh, randomly uh, generated points to compute the regularizer. And we use a very small network, only three hidden layers of 32 neurons. And here you can see the hyperparameters. Mainly you can see that the incompressible uh, lambda is much higher than the background uh, lambda. So this is the uh, synthetic example. It's, it's very, very simple, but the idea here is that you have uh, an incompressible ring. So uh, the incompressibility property there is exactly satisfied, and the other parts do not satisfy this constraint. And this is the reference and the template image. And this is, this is our, our predictions. I know it is looks very uh, blurry, um, but I want, wanted to show you exactly how the strains look for these um, examples. Um, so here I'm plotting the predictions of the, of the Jacobian and the formation field. So in the background, you can see the, the Jacobian for the ground truth. And you can see that it's, um, it's a constant by parts. And when we try to approximate this with regular physics informal networks, uh, we can see that it, it struggles to, uh, to capture these discontinuities. And uh, when we include the Fourier features, it, it actually uh, does a much, much better job. And if we, if we take a look at the, uh, we, if we make a cut here uh, and plot the displacements, uh, for example, you can see that the, uh, the, the red line, which is the original pins, really struggle to capture these discontinuities. Um, but we, if you include Fourier features, we can do a much better work. And if we do this for the strain, which is the quantity that we're interested in, we actually get a um, much, much better results when using Fourier features. And the same for the uh, volume, um, for the volume change. It's true that you had some oscillations, but you also gain a lot in inaccuracy. Okay, so then we um, we tried this on real data. So there is a very nice uh, ben benchmark paper published, uh, I think, in 2012, uh, where they um, gather many different image modalities um, for 15 different uh, volunteers. Um, and one of the of the um, images image modalities that they tried was exactly uh, Cine. So this was the perfect data set for us. Um, what is actually really good is that they uh, provided some uh, ground truth where some observers uh, tracked, uh, tracked the, the landmarks, a couple of uh, 12 landmarks for each patient. So which are the points that you can see here, but they actually tracked them using a uh, tagged MRI images and then they registered them to the scene images. And you can see here that even two observers uh, which are represented by the, by the yellow and red dots, they do not perfectly agree uh, when they track these images. So it's actually a very, very difficult problem even, even for a human. And this is how the scene images that we will be using look like. We're actually only going to be using these, which are the short axis uh, images. So the resolution in plane is actually really good. It's about one millimeter, uh, but the we only have 14 slices in the longitudinal direction. So there the slide, the slide thickness is about eight millimeters. Uh, and that will actually cause a lot of problems um, for from uh, all the methods. Um, so we also want uh, to compare against other uh, methods that have attempted to solve this problem because uh, there have been many attempts. And the first one is, um, a method that I will call UPF, um, and it's based on uh, splines, um, which are also a uh, time continuous, and they actually define a velocity field and they integrate it. And there is another method from INRIA, which is called ILOG demons, um, and they also they they exactly impose the, the incompressibility. So uh, it's comparable to our method. The difference is that. Uh, exactly uh, imposed it. 
And lastly, um, an, a more modern uh, method, uh, which is called Carmen. Um, and here they use a, a convolutional network, a neural network, and they can predict the, the displacements and the strains uh, in one shot. So they train previously trained with a with a, a big data set, and then they can set a new image and try to predict and try to predict their results for for this new patient. Um, so in in our case, we are only training for for one patient. Uh, so we receive a new set of images and we train it specifically for that patient. Uh, so we don't have any any bias that might come with a uh, by using a larger data set. So for the cine case, um, as you saw, these are movies. So the heart is, is actually moving uh, in a sequence of frames. So what we use is a, now a time continuous uh, neural network. So here we added the time as one of the uh, of one of the input parameters, and we keep the the positions within the image. But we still predict uh, the deformation mapping. But now it, this will depend on time. So here we are going to um, compose the template image at some frame i for the time i, and we're going to always compare it to the reference. And the regularization and the incompressibility actually remain the same, but we need to enforce it at all times. So some details about how we did this. Um, so now we use the L1 norm to compute the image similarity. Um, this gave us much, much better results. Um, basically because there are some structures in the images that appear and disappear because the slice thickness is so big that some features disappear. So we were having uh, some problems with that. Um, and what is uh, what worked out surprisingly well is that we only use a batch size of one image. So at each optimizer uh, iteration, we're just comparing uh, one image, uh, one template image to the reference. And we are going to switch that image at every iteration, and it works uh, really, really well. And also, we uh, randomly select uh, 1,000 points in the background and 1,000 points in the ventricle to compute the regularizer. And these are uh, sampled at, at random times. So we just sample at random times and select 1,000 points in space and um, compute the regularizer. And we train for 300,000 iterations of Adam. And the networks are still fairly small, so only 5 million layers with 64 uh, neurons. And here you can see the, the hyperparameters. Again, the, the incompressible region has, is much more penalized than the background area. So here you can see some results. Uh, so these are the results for uh, when we don't use uh, Fourier features. And you can see that we can track the the movement of the heart quite well and also you can see that the resol longitudinal resolution is actually pretty pretty bad you can see it from this image and another uh, thing is that here i'm plotting the uh, jacobian so that is the the volume changes and if the volume doesn't change it should be around one and you can see that it remains in a very reasonable uh, range so we here we can see another cut and these are uh, the the images that have a much, much better resolution and basically encode all the information. So here you can see the same results, but now when with Fourier features, you can see that it deforms a, a little bit more, but it's still very comparable. So um, here you can see the results for the 15 different volunteers. Um, so in the with the wireframe, you can see the end diastolic configuration. And here I'm showing everything at N systole. Um, and you can see that it generally it works uh, better. We we see that the heart uh, tends to get um, in the circumferential direction, tends to get smaller. So that means that it's pumping blood. And it also um, seems to be getting shorter, which should also happen. And here you can see, for example, B5. Uh, the volunteer five didn't work and it's just completely uh, frozen. And um, so here we are always using the same parameter for, for, for the same parameters for all volunteers regarding their regularization. Now, if we apply the Fourier features, um, you can see um, similar results, uh, but now the volunteer five uh, improves. 
Uh, but for example, you can see that now here the volunteer two has like a pre debug deformation there. Uh, but many of them um, work uh, work uh, actually fine. So it's um, basically when we add Fourier features, uh, you can see that the network is more flexible to learn things, but sometimes that uh, is, is a bit too much. So regarding the landmark tracking, we actually outperform the current methods. Um, so these are our results with two levels of regularization. And most uh, all of them actually perform better. Um, and we perform much, much better when we uh, decrease the regularizer. But what we saw there is that doing that actually hinders the, uh, I mean, you don't get very realistic um, uh, strains. So if there's a trade off between getting good strains and getting good landmarks. So here you can see how the landmarks are tracked. Um, so if we make some comparisons to the to the other methods, um, you can see, for example, Carmen, which is this convolutional network, really, really fails to capture the, the longitudinal uh, deformations. So it's basically just deforming the images in plane, but it's not able to uh, capture that the heart is actually shortening. Um, and something similar happens to INRIA. And the other best method is uh, UBF. And you can see that our method uh, can actually uh, move the points uh, downwards uh, a little bit more, but it still uh, fails to, ma mainly it fails in the longitudinal direction because we had have a much uh, less information. So the idea here was to compute um, to compute a cardiac strain. That was the, the goal of, of our study. And here you can see um, I'm showing for B13, which is not our best volunteer. I just wanted to show a realistic case. Um, and here you can see um, the, the strains for uh, basal regions or near the base of the heart, uh, mid region, and an apical region. And for the mid region, actually works really, really well. So you can see here the red and blue curves are our method with and without for the features. And we have a really nice negative longitudinal uh, strain, yeah, similar to what is reported in the literature, a negative circumferential strain in a very good range. And actually, the, the radial strain is higher than the other methods. And this was one of the problems of the current methods that uh, they struggle to capture this radial strain. So in, in the midsection, we're actually doing uh, super, super well. But now, if you take a look at the other two regions, uh, we have some problems, especially uh, in the longitudinal strain. Um, so there is, uh, and uh, we know why this happens. This because the the images uh, end here, so we don't have much information to uh, actually learn the strain in the in the basal region and the apical region. So there we the the main drawback here is that we have some a positive longitudinal strain, which is, is not very realistic. Um, another nice thing is of our method is that it doesn't pro, uh, um, produce any drift, which is this phenomenon here that you can see for UPF. So we know that after a cardiac cycle, the strain should be roughly uh, zero, but the UPF method uh, has a hard time uh, sometimes re returning to zero, and it predicts that at the end there will be some strain which is not very realistic. So um, here I'm showing um, general trends of uh, a strain um, for all the volunteers. Um, and here we can see that in general, our, this is, I'm showing the, the longitudinal strains for all the volunteers. So, and this is a bio input, so it, it shows the distribution at N uh, systole. So here you can see that our two methods, the red and blue, uh, tend to have more positive uh, longitudinal strains, which is not a good thing. Um, and you can see that there's always more variability in the blue, which is the uh, Fourier features. Now, if we look at the circumferential strains, uh, actually here, most of the methods agree quite well. And it's uh, what we saw in the previous plot as well. And in general, they are negative, which is, uh, which is a good thing, because otherwise the heart will not be uh, contracting. And if we look at the radial um, direction, 
our method uh, consistently predicts higher rail strain. And this is a good thing because the, the values reported here are more in line to values uh, obtained with other methods. Um, so that's an advantage of our method. So I wanted to end by showing some ongoing work. Um, so the previous work is, uh, there is a preprint and the paper is under review. And actually the code is um, open now, so you can uh, test it. But I also wanted to show some of the stuff that we have been doing uh, daily to improve this. So <clears throat> the the heart, uh, the the cardiac cells are organized in fibers. So here I'm showing a representation of those fibers that, and these fibers have like some very specific architecture and the, the angle that they are oriented varies from the inside, so the endocardium to the outside, which is the uh, epicardium. And you can see that rotation in this movie. So, and we also know that these fibers uh, actually contract. So in a healthy heart, you will expect that these fibers reduce their length. Um, the, we, there are some images methods to get these fiber orientations, but I think they are, have been recently developed and I don't think they are widely available in the clinic uh, yet. So, but we can have an estimation uh, using some rule-based methods um, which is actually how we generated this figure. Uh, so you can, uh, we can get an, a rough estimation because uh, all the hearts should have um, a very similar architecture in this regard. Um, and then we can compute uh, the fiber stretch. And this is a little bit more continuing mechanics, but uh, if we have the, the, the formation mapping, we can compute the the deformation gradient, and then with that we can compute the how much a fiber is elongating or contracting, and this is this quantity here, uh, lambda f uh, squared, and this depends on the on the orientation of the fiber. So we need to know locally how the fiber is oriented. So if this value is less than one, then that means that the fiber is contracting, and is greater than one. This means that the fiber is stretching, which is um, and physiological, because we know that they have, uh, from end diastole to the end systole, the fibers should be contracting. So then we uh, postulate an, an additional uh, loss term for the um, to train warping. And it looks a bit complicated, but basically what we're saying he here is that if, if the fiber stretch is greater than one, so that means that the, that the fiber is stretching, uh, we're going to penalize that. So we are going to encourage that all the fibers are contracting or nearly contracting. So here I will show you a movie. Uh, in the left, you can see if we include this penalization and on the right, you can see if we don't include it. So this is kind of the baseline case. And here I'm plotting the color scale is the fiber stretch. So if it's gray, it means that the fibers are not stretching. Stretching. If if it's blue, it means that they are contracting, which is what we ex expect. And if it's red, it means that they are they are uh, expanding, which is not realistic. So you can see in the in the in the fiber uh, penalization, most of the fibers are actually contracting, which is a good thing. And if we don't include this penalization, you can get these very unrealistic results here. Um, that are caused by this uh, very rough uh, image resolution in the longitudinal direction. But even here, you can get some really big longitudinal um, uh, some uh, fibers stretching. So, and here you can see that this actually help us uh, reduce uh, the longitudinal strains, or at least the variability of the of the longitudinal strains. And when we compare the red uh, with the blue uh, distributions, uh, so especially we get a little less uh, variability. Um, but it's but it's actually really interesting is that this even further improves the the landmark uh, tracking. Um, so when we, we compare to this ground truth that was provided by the data set, this is our best result uh, ever. Uh, that when we include this penalization of the fibers, we can improve the strain estimation and also imp improve the landmark estimation, which was something that we didn't see before with the other regularizer. So the other regularizer, if we increase it, we will 
lose, um, um, uh, we will, the error in the landmarks will increase. But now if we increase this regularizer up to some point, uh, we will improve the landmark uh, prediction, which is really, uh, really good. So to summarize, um, uh, I have presented a method uh, to perform ima image registration based on physics in formula networks that takes advantage of the incompressibility of cardiac tissue. And it shows a very good ag agreement with the uh, manually tracked landmarks uh, in this cardiac benchmark that I showed you. Uh, we also showed higher radial strains and we don't show any drift, which is one of the advantages against uh, current methods. And now our current work focuses on incorporating more knowledge um, and specifically the fiber contraction. And we can do this basically for free. I mean, it doesn't take much longer to train a network with this uh, additional regularization term. So the idea later will be to uh, extract some features of this strain display of, of these strains, and maybe we can correlate, the, uh, correlate them to uh, heart diseases to make a better, better diagnosis. Um, thanks uh, for your attention, and I will take any questions. Thank you, Francisco. That was very, very um, thorough and great work, actually. Uh, very interesting. If you have any questions for Francisco, please type them in the chat, or you can raise your hand, and I will take your questions. We have one from Y. You want to go ahead? Yeah, hi. Uh... Yeah, um, Yap from uh, Bioengineering at um, Imperial College. This is a really nice book. Thank you so much for the talk. I want, to, and so we also have, uh, have interest in uh, strains of the heart and uh, motion tracking and, um, and so forth. I wanted to ask about cementation. Uh, how did you get your uh, uh, cementation? And because mm -hmm. at the inside of the heart, you have the trabeculation. And that's a, a very funny part of the heart because we, 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 we can't really say that it's uh, incompressible because you know, they are kind of loosely packed. And when they come together, they actually squeeze blood uh, out between their spaces. So at the very inner layer, they're actually not um, um, incompressible and, and it's not easy to treat that. So I was wondering, you know, how you would, um, uh, what do you think of that, that problem? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, the, we, for the data set that we tested, the, the segmentations were provided. So we haven't uh, tried it on like doing segmentation. I, I know there are some very nice tools that will do this automatically for us. Um, and, and I agree that there is like the incompressibility of the heart is like a very debated topic. And, and you can find values in the literature that vary quite a bit. But the idea here is that we don't enforce a fully the incompressibility. Um, so, but we penalize it. So the idea, if you do these problems without any, without the regularization, you, you can get a, a volume change of 90% that we know that will not happen in reality. So if you see some of the figures, we have variations between, I don't know, maybe minus 15% maybe of volume contraction. So I think we can still accommodate for the trabecular compacting um, that, that shouldn't be an issue because we are not exactly uh, enforcing the incompressibility. So can I ask a real quick uh, next question? Yes. Yeah, just uh, uh, wondering, have you tried uh, this on um, ultrasound uh, echocardiography? Um, no, we haven't, but I think we have the data because this benchmark also provides the data. So maybe that will be a next uh, step to try. No. Thank you. It, but it should work. I mean, I mean, of course, with a lot of tweaking, but <laughs> it should work. And yeah, no so there will be more noise and stuff. So there will be maybe some tweaking needed for mm -hmm. how to get it to work better or more suitable, probably. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, do you have any more questions for Francisco? Um, yes, Cesar, if, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Marta. Uh, hi, Francisco. Thanks very much for, for the talk. It was fantastic. Um, I was wondering why not use a fully connected neural network, which is the standard for for registrations. I know then you can't use automatic differentiation, but did you have a play with that? Uh, so you mean a convolutional network, right? Yes, a convolutional. Sorry, did I say fully connected? I meant a convolutional. <laughs> connected. Um, yeah. So I mean the the. Um, 
the idea of using, I mean, it's, it's mainly the, the automatic differentiation. And also because I said that the spectral bias is bad, uh, but it actually also helps you a little bit with the, you have some kind of implicit regularization. So when you use a fully connected network, even with Fourier features, um, you kind of have connected all the displacements, which I think is something that is lost if you use the, if you use a convolutional network. Um, so I think those are the, the main two advantages. And I think the automatic differentiation actually helps quite a bit um, because you can get, um, basically do any uh, any strainer function that you want as regularizer or as complex as you want and you know that you will get um, a good result also i mean if you think like the slice thickness is actually quite big so if we wanted to do any differentiation on the longitudinal direction that would require some uh, additional um, tricks to make the convolutional network uh, work can can I ask something? So can I ask something else if if that's okay? Um, what what is happening with this background um, segmentation? What why do you need it? And it seems from your loss function, it seems that you use the similar properties for for everything else, which would be blood and organ, other organs, and all sorts of mm -hmm. different. Maybe I misunderstood what you're trying to do, and I yeah. don't know why you need it. So yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a good point, and we have actually tried removing the background regularization. I will make the code faster, but it doesn't perform better. Uh, I think that you still need some regularization surrounding the 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 heart, so it cannot go anywhere. And also, we have, for example, some problems where the landmarks that were tracked were outside the 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 region, uh, the ventricular region. So then you still need some kind of um, regularization because the, the image registration problem is ill-posed. So at least you'll need a little bit of, of uh, regularization to do the problem uh, accordingly. I, I know it's, it's, for example, modeling the blood that is uh, going out of the heart as a hyperelastic solid is not ideal, but it still gives you like some kind of nice deformation. And we actually don't really care about the results there. So it's, it's just um, just to make the problem a little bit more stable. Thank you, Francisco. So, so okay, Marta? Um, yeah, I had one cheeky final question, which was yeah. about boundary conditions. Which yep. I didn't understand which ones you're using, and I was wondering if it would help with that collapse of the, of the um, basal part of the heart that you were, or strange motion there that you were mentioning. Hmm. Yeah, so we, we don't use any boundary conditions. Um, yeah, uh, at the moment we don't use any boundary conditions and it's, yeah, may, maybe we can try to impose something on the surroundings or something like that. Um, but yeah, at least we use something very generic. It will be hard to argue exactly what boundary conditions you want to use. Um, but maybe we can yeah think about something clever to include in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. There's two more questions on the chat. Um, Claire says, thanks, Francisco. I wonder what the ratio was of the three terms in your loss function. Um, I will need to check them because I don't know them. Um, so yeah, that should be here. Um, OK, so the, the, um, the image uh, registration part will have a weight of one, um, and then the regularization will have a weight of 10 to the minus five. And except for the incompressibility part, where we basically multiply that 10 to the minus five to 10 to the five, so we'll get a, a weight of one to enforce the incompressibility inside the heart, but the background regularization will have a weight of 10 to the minus five. Can I can I follow up the question on how were those chosen? Yeah, so we the idea is that we did a lot of experiments in the volunteer one, and then we tried them with all the other with all the other uh, volunteers, um, and we saw that that was like a sweet spot. Actually, we also tried with a lower regularizer, and it improved the landmark registration a little bit, but the strings were 
like really, really bad. So that's why we stick with that parameter. And you can see it's actually not perfect because, for example, here in V5, it doesn't work out. So uh, yeah, it's, I mean, we wanted to be like really honest and say, okay, we're going to choose uh, these parameters and type with all, all the volunteers because otherwise you can always optimize for um, one of or the other volunteers. We, but we just to try to optimize all of them for B1 and then use for or use the same parameter for all the cases. Cool. Yeah, thank you. And there's another question in the chat by Chun Wajab. Uh, yeah, not not really um, a question. It was like a very good question that right. Marco had. And I was maybe offering my own uh, view, view on that. Yeah, you want to uh, go ahead? Oh, yeah. I mean, because Marta was one was asking about the background regularization as one. And I'm, I'm just um, thinking that, you know, uh, if you impose all those um, hyperelastic in the background, I mean, the background of the heart is like the lungs. So it could help with the motion of that. You know, you have to apply some mechanical uh, constraint on that. It, mm -hmm. it, it could be helping because it's, you know, making the, the motion of the surrounding uh, tissues more um, realistic. So that sounds like a good strategy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, There's another question in the chat by Fan Wen Wang. Thanks, Francisco, for your fantastic presentation. I wonder how the F, the sorry, BFGS optimization tangle with the Adam optimization. Um, yeah, so we train, so we only did that for the for the synthetic case. And actually we have now showed that you don't need it. Um, but basically you train for uh, with Adam for uh, until you get to a nice uh, area of the loss function. And then you can really reduce the loss function, uh, maybe sometimes even to an order of magnitude if you use BFGS. Um, so this worked really, really well if you have a synthetic case, uh, but in in for the real uh, case, it's too expensive to use because you cannot do mini match in, in BFGS. So it, it typically is very, very expensive. Um, but we actually showed that if you train with Adam for, I don't know, maybe three times, but what we were training, you will get like very comparable results. Uh, so it's just that BFGS is a lot more efficient when you have a small network to, to get to those uh, nice solutions. So if you're doing physics informal networks in a simple case, it's always a, a good trick to try. Cool, yeah, thank you. Is that okay? Uh, there's another question from Marina. Uh, thanks for the great talk. When you talk about the fiber contraction, you assume that all fibers should contract, but that, but that assumption will be violated if you consider some pathologies such as scar or patients with dyssynchrony. Dyssynchrony. Have you thought about how you deal with that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is a, a great point. And I think the, the way, so it's, again, we are not exactly imposing that all the fibers should uh, should contract. So, so far the results I show you are only in healthy patients, so that should be a case, uh, but we're penalizing uh, extension of the fibers. Um, so the fibers can still uh, uh, extend. So let me show you the movie here. Um, one more. <laughs> Okay, so here in the movie, you can see that even when we penalize, there are still some slightly red regions here. So that means that the fibers can still stretch, but we don't want a behavior like this. I mean, I don't think like even in a in a, a patient with a disease, we will see a stretch of 50% in the fibers. So we can play a little bit with the weight of this, of this loss function to, accommodate for uh, for patients that might have uh, some diseases. Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, I think we can still tolerate some extension of the fibers, uh, but we're just penalizing like very large extensions. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, in the meantime, can I ask you, I, I mean, cardiology is not my field of expertise, but if it's trivial, like how do you choose the collocation points that you mentioned? 
Um, yeah, so we what we do is that we create like a very fine volumetric mesh. So here you can only see in the surface, but I mean inside there are some nodes. Mm -hmm. And then we so that will give us like a very large set of points that we can uh, select from, and then we randomly select one thousand at every iteration. But those get selected all over the volume, or yes, could be anywhere. Uh, but yes, I mean, if you have a like a uniform kind of rel relatively uniform mesh, you would expect that you're always sampling everywhere, yeah. and okay. also because you do so many iterations that in the end you will cover all the points many many times. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Final questions for Francisco. No, I don't see I have, one. Yep. I have one, if I may. Yeah, um, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Costabal. It was a really great talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering for um, patient, this is kind of a follow up to uh, Marina's question regarding the fiber uh, penalization for patients with, uh, with heart failure. Their, their Frank Starling forces change due to the change of the nature of the myocardium. So, what I was wondering if if you had also um, theorized about how how you may modify the model to uh, deal with that that pathology. Um, so not not really. I mean, the idea is to to use like very generic regularizers like the incompressibility or this penalizing the fiber extension, so they can be applicable to many many cases. So uh, I think you can always put more and more information uh, into the network um, but we need to be careful to give it general enough so if a case doesn't comply with those physics you can still um, capture it so i think these two regularizers satisfies those uh, conditions um, maybe the, the fiber extension penalization we need to revise it a little bit uh, but i think there are very easy ways to to accommodate for that um so yeah but i i haven't i i i don't want to design a, a regularizer for a specific disease because sometimes the goal is to detect that disease so i would wouldn't know a priori if i if the disease is present or not in the in the images thank you thank you um yeah i think that's it's, it's 5 p.m now so we can close the talk today uh, thank you, Francisco, for sharing your talk with us and your time. And yeah, great work. And yeah, thank you everyone for attending another session of the seminars. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And yeah, no worries. Thank you. Bye bye.